When was the last time you seriously sat down and tried to draw something? Until recently for me, that was six years ago, back in October of 2017. My favorite artist, Felix Colgrave, recently came out with an iconic animated short film called Double King, and it was so vibrant and colorful and delightfully weird that I was captivated. After what must have been my 10th rewatch, I knew I had to do something to get that building creative energy out. After roughly three hours of painstaking drawing, erasing, and redrawing, I made this. It's a trace, sure, but I still felt damn proud of it. There was something about just putting graphite to paper and making a finished product that, while certainly not original, was a reflection of the things dominating my mind at the time. That sort of satisfaction can only be achieved by creating something. And maybe that's why Chicory struck such a chord with me. Chicory is a game that's not how it appears on the surface. One glance and you get the impression of media made for a younger audience. A color by numbers book, but with a bit more pizzazz and video game elements baked into it. Much like how you can look at Double King and see a Saturday morning cartoon kids would watch. However, more than a cursory glance will quickly lay bare the much darker and more complex themes hidden behind their disarming aesthetics. Chicory thrives off this sort of thing, not subverting your expectations, but rather exceeding them, and giving much more of an experience than you expected or even realized you were getting in the first place. Yes, this is a color by numbers sort of game, but where do we go from there and how do we build on that? Of course we believe anybody can draw, but now how do we encourage that in our players? Yeah, you are a little doggy running around having an adventure, but we need to make that even cuter, damn it! Okay, full disclosure. When I'm talking about the game design specifics and basically anything that sounds smart, I'm largely pulling from these three sources. Game creator Greg Lobanov's GDC talk, his Design Fun Facts Twitter thread, and a Medium article written by game composer Lena Rain. Links to all three of those in the description. When it comes to the thing that Chicory does well, I think of three things. Those are encouraging player creativity, allowing the player to feel smart, and properly setting a tone. There's an excellent level early in the game that showcases these ideas, but to get there I need to start spoiling the game. So if you're interested in a touching, cute, and intensely creative adventure game, then go. Get out. It's $20, it's easily worth your money, and Lena is the same composer for Celeste, so at the very least get it for the music alone. Go! Play it! Now! Go! You start off as a dog named Pizza. And no, that's not just because that's what I landed on as my favorite food when the game asked. It's just a coincidence that's also the default canon name, which made research very confusing at first. You're a janitor for the wielder of the brush, who at this moment is Chicory. They're the only one responsible for keeping the world full of color. As you could probably guess, all the color goes away and now you have the brush and it's time to find out what's happened, but not without painting some stuff first. That's what good mac and cheese sounds like! After some running around, doing some coloring, meeting townsfolk, doing favors for them like designing a t-shirt, and going through eyeball hell, we're tasked with heading for the Wielder Temple in search of answers. This is when the game really gets going and the training wheels come off. No more setting up the story, setting, or mechanics of the brush. You've learned how to ride the bike, now do it on two wheels while I go and make some mac and cheese. Okay, maybe this metaphor has gotten away from me. On the way, you talk to some people about a rock slide, bounce on some mushrooms, find a child? Uh, and make your way to a nearby town to talk to an old wielder who shares some wisdom and a code to the front door of the temple. In this short 15 minute section, we can already see all of the three core ideas at play. Let's begin with the player feeling smart. Lobanov shows his game design experience here by teaching the player mechanics instantly and organically. The only way that you've been able to interact with the world at this point is through painting things with the brush. So naturally, when you come across this plant, you paint it and oh, like that, you get it instantly. You get an idea of purpose, distance, and speed from the single click. No pop-up prompt, no NPC saying, hey, did you know that you can left click to make color happen? And they get immediately expanded upon 30 seconds later. This kind of show you once and you get it design is present throughout the entire game. Introduce, expand, and master. 
Now, Chicory obviously provides every opportunity to let the player play around with color and paint, but that isn't the only way the game encourages player creativity. Another way is by giving them the slickest wardrobe. You get everything, from t-shirts to dresses to sick-ass cloaks, and you can lock colors or outfits as you please. Not to mention, you can color other NPCs in their outfits as well. I like coloring every NPC with the limited color palette I have in every area, since it gives them their own kind of regional feel. You can even color NPCs during cutscenes, like your mom or your dad's grabby little hand. These outfits and such are rewards for exploration, and they are absolutely everywhere. But they're not the only thing you get for exploring. You also get brush styles. These can make your brush color in certain patterns, or cause your brush to have unique interactions with the world while you use it. A lot of the interesting ones can be found in that design fun facts thread I mentioned, like this music brush for instance. Sound effects for many brush styles are tuned to make arpeggios that are in key with the current BGM. The music note brush style takes this a step further by always playing on the beat of the BGM, and if you double tap, it'll make a chord. So what about setting a mood? Well, this gets more into the story, but I believe the biggest player here is the way that music is used. After getting the cue about the rock slide and being sent on your way, the music takes an immediate upswing in tempo. It's almost like a marching theme that immediately makes you feel like a dog on a mission. Music loops are dynamic and long enough that they never feel repetitive or grating, with some tracks going as long as 5 minutes in certain parts of the game. The music calms down again once you reach the town, and things get much more subtle when speaking with Cardamom, the old wielder. Quiet, intimate track hopes to sell the somber tone that he expresses as he recalls his days as a wielder, telling you his regrets and his burdens, coming off as a gentle giant carrying a heavy load from the past, and he's reluctant to help you down that same path. He relents, of course, and this somber tone carries over perfectly as you enter the wielder temple for the first time. The background music has a pretty consistent sound as you travel throughout the overworld, with wood or wind instruments usually taking center stage. This sound changes to match the tone, but it stays fairly recognizable whether you're adventuring through the forest or relaxing in a cafe. Entering the Wielder Temple, that sound shifts, and it helps to build a very specific feel. The slow, low-key acoustic guitar is paired with nothing but dead air, echoing down the empty hallways and crumbling stone. Slowly, almost hesitantly, a recorder works its way into the composition. It's an intruder from the outside, much like pizza, much like you are. This was a place meant for the brush and its wielders, and that's not supposed to be you. As you descend lower into the temple, floor by floor, the composition gets more layered and evolved. As you get more of a feel for the history and the prestige of the wielders, you start to realize just how important of a role you have now. You've been thrust into a job that seems too big for somebody who was just a janitor not too long ago, and that weight is getting heavier. However, there is still room for optimism, still room for that upbeat sound that seems to follow you around wherever you go. Chicory is here too. Motifs of her theme bleed their way into the composition and work with Pizza's optimism. She's been through this before herself, and with her blessing, maybe you can rise to the task that she's laid before you. Getting to the third floor, there's this heavy drop.
sound of the temple practically pulls you to the floor, crushing you under its weight. It's so serious, so old, and it feels so overwhelming. Just as you feel the true size of your adventure dawning on you, there's a break, and that comfortable recorder comes in to pull you back to your feet. Pizza's enthusiasm and bright outlook are the only things that can beat back the doubts and insecurities that you've fallen into. With this building vigor and a deep breath, it's time to head into the basement and face what you came here for. Pizza's got this. You've got this. Now we've seen a boss fight already with the, um... Eyeball Void. But that was a tutorial boss. A, a baby's first boss fight to whet your appetite. This boss is when things get especially interesting, and it's time to build out on those bases that we've already laid. It's best described by its accompanying track, Probably Ancient Evil, and I think I just want to let that track itself do the talking, because man, this shit is so good! <laughs> Modern synths and distortions are incredibly jarring, and the sudden jump in intensity helps to get your heart pumping with the music. No longer are you going at your own pace. You've wandered into the territory of something wholly unlike anything you've seen so far. It's almost like the distortion of the natural, so you'll notice that I use a lot of synths and also acoustic instruments run through guitar pedals and amps and all sorts of literal distortion to create a sound that's an amplified and chaotic version of reality. The inversion of color furthers this distortion, feeling like a perversion of the core ideas the game has set forth. No longer can you color everywhere, now you can't color anywhere. Being thrown right into combat and basically being told, good luck, is exactly how a fight like this should be handled. You're given a small introduction with these eyes, and obviously you're going to interact with them the only way you interact with anything, and once you get an idea of hit the eyes with the brush, you're pushed right into the thick of things. Further boss fights continue this theme of on-the-fly gameplay mixed with an unsettling and distorted atmosphere. I don't want to get too into all of them because I know some of you ignored my spoiler warning, but there is one that I do really want to talk about. To get there, let's walk through the story a bit more. Something I really like about this game is that Pizza isn't just a silent protagonist. Most of the time when a protagonist is silent, it's so that the player can easily imprint themselves onto the character that they're playing. They become less of a character and more of an avatar for the player to inhabit. That way they can think, how would I feel in this situation? It can be effective, sure, and I don't think it's necessarily bad, but at the same time, a protagonist can have all kinds of personality and still be easy to empathize with. The trick is that they have to be well written, and pizza is very well written. If you've had any kind of artistic ambition, a hero that you look up to, or huge responsibilities thrust upon you before you felt like you were ready, then you've been in their shoes. Their personality has been present the whole game, but this is the point in the story where we really start digging into the character. After a heart-to-heart -heart with Chicory and later her mentor Blackberry, you head into Gulp Swamp to take on your next challenge. There's one line by this little guy named Shroom, who is small, and I love him, that has always stuck with me. She kept color and stuff- Alright, I'm not doing that fucking accent. <laughs> she kept coloring stuff in, and staring at it, and then erasing it, and then coloring it in again, again, and again, and again, at the same spot, all day. Meanwhile, the whole swamp needed color. She was getting real frustrated. I love this line because it's a really quick and simple way to reinforce Chicory's mind state before she stopped using the brush. You just got a demonstration of her artistic ability when she painted pizza, so it's humanizing to have this incredibly talented character be so frustrated and dissatisfied with their work. It's also very relatable to me, personally. I have a huge issue with writing these scripts partly because of this exact feeling. It grinds my production speed to a crawl for so long, and that makes me feel guilty. And then there's so many writes and rewrites and even voice or video takes that just get dropped and discarded. It's small details like this that really give the main characters of this game so much depth and personality. And it makes the fight with Chicory much more emotionally charged.
coming into this corrupted tree and seeing her just berate Pizza, lash out at them, and say all the things that they fear the most, it doesn't matter if this is the real trickery or just the corruption playing tricks. The feeling is the same. You finish the fight, go confront her, and instead of a refutation, you just get shut down. Pizza tries to move forward, but now there's this cloud following them everywhere. Getting a message from these little bugs, painting the world along the way, that worry stays in the back of your mind. You're constantly reminded by Pizza wearing this worried look no matter what you're doing. Pizza only drops this look during certain points, like talking with your sister and reading Dear God! Okay, quick side tension about Queen Drosera. So, Grub Deep kinda rules? This area has so much fucking character to it. Like how instead of being named after food, all the bugs are named after plants. Drosera is actually a type of sundew, which is a carnivorous plant, which is, yeah, that's comforting. You actually don't speak their language either, so until you get a translator to literally live on your head, you have no idea what they're saying. I also love how Drosera follows you around as you move, and it's unsettlingly quick too. She has absolutely no concept of personal space and will just stare you down the whole time. Also, the name of the song that plays while you talk to her is called Her Wretched Utterances? Okay, all right, I'm done. On to the boss of this chapter and things feel different. It starts off the same as the others with the eyeball void and you think, okay, I'm just gonna plow through this one so I can go talk to Chicory again. Once I'm through this fight, I'm sure the plot will move forward and... This is, admittedly, a little heavy-handed, but frankly, this fight hits way too hard for me to care. Let's break it down. Looking at it, it seems really, really simple, but as with every mechanic in this game, it is introduced and then instantly expanded upon. Some phases you attack, let's call them dark pizza, directly with the brush, and other times you have to hit them with the reflection. Learning when to swap sides is essential to this fight, and this game gives you a few subtle clues as to when that swap happens. Firstly, the fact that Dark Pizza inverts their color, but the real kicker comes from my favorite part of this fight. I firmly believe that this song called is the song that best demonstrates Lena's mastery. The first time you hear major sections of this song play in reverse, there's this real sense of unease that sets in as you second guess what you just heard. The entire fight is full of second guessing, whether it be the music changing on the fly or trying to quickly orient the brush correctly, and it does a very good job of making you empathize with pizza through expert use of Ludo narrative. When you feel you're finally starting to get a sense of the confusion you're facing, the rug gets ripped right out from under you. Now everything is inverting and shifting. Your relationship with the brush has to shift with it and new attacks are coming out of nowhere. If you can't keep up with the changes, if you can't make sense of everything changing constantly, then you risk being destroyed by your own reflection. This unease carries even through the final blow of the fight. When you finish off the boss, there is no slow come down or obvious break in the fight at first. Instead, the screen looks exactly the way it does when you take too many hits. Pizza fills in with their normal colors and falls to the ground, and it's only when they start talking that you realize you've been tricked. There is no real resolution either. Dark Pizza just disappears, literally with a cartoon pop. And when you go to report to Queen Drosera, she rightly points out that the Dark Roots haven't receded at all. In fact, they've only gotten worse despite your best efforts. The darker influence of those who came before you, those you look up to, and the person in your mirror don't go away so easily. Okay, I know I'm leaving things off on a low note here, but that's because you should play this game. If you can spare the cash and you want to see how things play out, then you owe it to yourself. I wouldn't suggest watching a Let's Play either, because you can't get the true chicory experience without getting distracted and coloring shit for a few hours. Even if, like me, 
you go in feeling like you have zero artistic talent, you find yourself really trying anyway, and it's really rewarding. There were times early on where I was just kind of fucking around, like, with this really lazy, incredible masterpiece of a son. But as the game went on, I found myself really wanting to take my time and make something that actually looks kind of good. It's the kind of game where you have to really allow yourself to work its magic, and the team who worked on Chicory give you every single nudge in that direction. If there is any lesson that I took away from the game, it's that no matter what you may think about your own art, you should keep going. When I see things made by artists with messages about art creation, and they express fears and doubts that I've personally felt, it's very heartening. There is no correct time to start on a project, and you will get better with time. As long as you practice, try new things, and most importantly, care about your work, you will get better. This isn't my first time trying things on YouTube. I've been trying to make videos since I was 15, playing emulated Castlevania on a laptop with my friend, and every single time I've tried to pick it back up again, I've dropped it. This time around, my headspace has been a lot better. I've stopped comparing myself to YouTube giants and started comparing myself to who I was a few months ago. Why did I do an Amnesia playthrough? Well, that's what all the Let's Players started with. Why did I have an intro and an outro for every video? Well, that's what they were doing. Why am I making videos now talking about games I really care about? Because that's what I want to be doing. I may not really know what I'm doing just yet, but I'm already much better than I was only six months ago, and that's what's really moving me forward. Wow, that got sappy towards the end there, didn't it? Uh, thank you for watching. This actually turned out to be a lot longer than I was expecting it to be. I expected this to just be like a 15 minute bashed out video, but I had a lot more to say about the game than I expected. Um, I want to spend a few minutes to thank the devs here, so uh, sorry while I check their names. Uh, <laughs> First and foremost, I want to give a big thanks to Greg Lobanov, the lead designer and creator of the game. Um, I really, really liked his GDC talk about the game, and I think it really shows just how much he learned from his previous games. Uh, most specifically Wandersong, but really, really good stuff. There was a lot of uh, game design aspects that really impressed me. I also want to give a huge uh, shout out to Lena Rain as the lead composer because she did such an incredible job. I spent long enough in the video talking about the music anyway, but it seems like every single project that she composes for just has mwah, it's impeccable music. I, I've never seen her miss a single time. I also want to give a thanks to M. Halbertstadt for doing all of the sound design for the game. They did a really good job of making everything sound really light and poppy and fun, uh, very like lighthearted. Um, but then when they really needed to, they were good at uh, bringing down the scene a lot. And also, I know I was making mac and cheese jokes earlier, but like the paint sounds were fine. Um, huge, huge uh, props to Alexis Dean Jones. I did get that right. Yes, Alexis Dean Jones um, for doing the character design and animation. The characters in this game are so fucking cute. And I am so, I, I think it really speaks to the, um, the criminal lack of attention that this game has gotten that I haven't seen like nearly enough fan art of these characters uh, flying around the internet. And I follow artists online. If this game had gotten the attention it deserves, I would have been seeing like chicory and pizza and cardamom and shit like that everywhere all over my timelines. But I just, I haven't. And I think that that's frankly criminal because this game deserves, my phone almost locked. This game deserves so much more attention, especially in the visuals department. And on the note of the visuals department, I also want to thank uh, Madeline Berger for doing all of the environmental art. Huge challenge that Madeline was presented with um, making environments that uh, that were readable in black and white and not just like not grayscale like how people usually think of black and white like actual proper black and white so that people could you know freely color it in like a color by numbers book. That must have been really fucking hard <laughs> to make like ledges and like walkable passages and like interactables like very easy to read um and i think that they really did a good job tackling that kind of challenge because i can only imagine how difficult that would be from a design and artistic perspective so like really 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 good job to madeline there um if you want to see more of what this team is doing in the future uh greg actually made a company 
uh, called Wishes Unlimited. He's like officially launched a company for his indie dev stuff. And they made a Discord server where they keep updates on like new projects. Uh, they have uh, Chicory channels. They have Wandersong channels, uh, all that good stuff. So if you want more updates on what they're doing, uh, I would look at the Discord. I'll leave a link for that in the description. I also want to give a huge thanks to my friends who did some voiceovers for the video. Uh, those would be Eric's and Niji. Um, I will leave links to their socials in the description. Uh, be warned, Niji's Twitter is very, very NSFW, so no children. <laughs> no children, please. <laughs> also, huge thanks to the person who drew pizza in the thumbnail uh, for this video. I wanted to, uh, their name is Chimera on Twitter. Um, I will also leave that in the description. I wanted to uh, have pizza in a very specific pose because I wanted it to be like a whole Mona Lisa thing. Um, but I couldn't find any official art or uh, anything with pizza in that pose uh, looking in that specific direction. So I just like looked for an artist to commission. It was really cheap. It was $40. They do great like night in the woods, like queer commissions for like... Uh, uh, for like profile pictures and stuff super super cute and like I even I even here's another thing too I even uh, said that they could just do flat color and they did shading anyway like above and beyond So please go look at Chimera and give them some love. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah uh, enough rambling um, Here's a couple of jokes that didn't quite make the cut and I will see you in uh, six months when I finish my next video, which is going to be about Risk of Rain uh, 1, 2, and the remake. Uh, that's what it's going to be about. It's going to be Risk of Rain. Thank you. Bye. The game can be really silly, too. At any given point, I can be walking around with 20 children in my pocket. Okay, maybe rewrite that joke. No, please. That's not a good shirt to identify with. No.